Hello fellow intelligent investors, my name is René Zalman and today I want to talk about Seth Planen, the founder of Bauports Group, who recently told investors in his Q4 letter that the large amounts of stimulus that have been put into the world's economies are masking the severity of the problems caused by the coronavirus pandemic. He claims that the Fed has broken the stock market and he compares investors to frogs in boiling water. And I'll explain what he means by this in this video, so let's get started. Have you ever wondered how you can make your hard-earned money work for you? Have you ever dreamed of building generational wealth and leaving a legacy? My name is René Zellman and I'll teach you how you can manage and invest your money with confidence, a long-term vision and without losing your mind. Join me on my journey of intelligent investing and learn how smart people can compound their money effectively and accumulate wealth. So to kick things off, let's briefly clarify who Seth Klarman is in the first place. Well, Seth Andrew Klarman is an American billionaire investor, hedge fund manager and a well-known author as well. He's a proponent of the value investing philosophy and he outlined his approach in his phenomenal book Margin of Safety which is be, can be considered a classic, but unfortunately is out of print. But if you desperately want a copy, you can get one for around $3,000 on eBay. And Klarman is the chief executive and portfolio manager of the Baupost Group, which was found, founded in 1983 and has average, has average returns of around 20% annually since inception. And as, as a result of this fabulous performance, Klarman is widely regarded as the next Warren Buffett. I can only encourage you to take a look at all of the interviews with Klarman that you can find on YouTube because I think they are an educational goldmine. All right, let's focus on Baupost's latest letter to investors. Unfortunately, I couldn't get my hands on the original document, the original letter yet. So most of the references I make in this video are actually based on a Financial Times article. But essentially, Klarman is making two claims. Firstly, he criticizes the Federal Reserve which he describes as an 800 pound gorilla for its fiscal policy of lowering interest rates and flooding the financial system with money since the coronavirus pandemic started essentially. And the point he's making here is that with an abundance of money, it is difficult to assess the health of the US economy. Here's what he wrote. With so much stimulus being deployed, trying to figure out if the economy is in recession it's like trying to assess if you had a fever after you just took a large dose of aspirin. Surely the drastic measures of central banks, not only in the US but essentially worldwide, have helped to boost economic activity and certainly rescued many businesses. But this policy also created some major risks for both the stock market but also for the economy. And Klarman essentially warns that many companies are only kept afloat because of this loose monetary policy and the massive governmental fiscal support. And I mean, even before the corona-induced recession, there were many companies that have only been kept alive because of the low interest rate environment and the aforementioned loose monetary policy that we're essentially seeing for a couple of years now. And these so-called zombie companies are neither dead nor alive, but instead maintain in a state of limbo by a constant injection of cheap credit. In a purely capitalistic system, however, they should go out of business and be buried because if they are artificially kept alive, they will continue to produ produce even though they are actually bleeding cash. Many of these businesses should be allowed to fail as they will likely be unable to pay back their debts in the long run at least. And they will ultimately drag down productivity and hinder innovation. As the Austrian economist Joseph Schumpeter described it, creative destruction is a necessary part of capitalism. In a way, central banks' ultra-easy monetary policy corrupts and undermines capitalism. And Klarman wrote, but they, so he's referring to central banks, have also kindled two dangerous ideas, that fiscal deficits don't matter, and that no matter how much debt is outstanding, we can effortlessly, safely and reliably pile on more. The biggest problem with these unprecedented and sustained government and central bank interventions is that risks to capital become masked even as they mount. And similarly, Stanley Druckenmuller once said, I will go to my grave believing that really loose monetary policy greatly contributed to the financial crisis. Every bust I had ever seen was preceded by an asset bubble generally set up by a too loose policy. All right. 
Before I move on, I just wanted to point out that it would be awesome if you could just quickly hit the like button or share the video with friends or on some social media platforms. And of course, subscribe to the channel. It would really help me to grow the channel, so thanks in advance. And the second point Klarman makes is that he observed an increasing level of speculation in the markets. In July of last year, he already expressed his frustration and wrote, Surreal doesn't even begin to describe this moment. Psychology is surprisingly ebullient, even though business fundamentals are often dreadful. And in his latest Q4 letter, Klarman told clients of his Baupost hedge fund that investors in the markets are basically behaving as if risks have simply vanished due to rock bottom interest rates and wave after wave of government stimulus. And David Einhorn, the founder of Greenlight Capital, he came to a similar conclusion in his Q4 letter to investors that was also released quite recently. He wrote, this begs the question as to why a stock might trade at 20 times a silly price. We think that the answer is that certain stocks are held exclusively by valuation in different investors. When we speak of valuation in different investors, we mean investors for whom valuation is not part of the process. They either will not, cannot, or choose not to consider valuation as a factor. And if you need any proof for Klarman's or Einhorn's claims, just take a look at the following chart. The Non-Profitable Technology Index, which was constructed by Goldman Sachs, tracks US listed companies and after years of sideways movement, these companies' share prices have gone through the roof. And let me show you another chart here showing the percentage of stocks trading at an EV to sales ratio above 20. Now if we focus on the first chart, there could be two explanations for this. One could be that companies are reinvesting all of their cash flows back into their business to achieve scale. And in a way I addressed this development in a previous video of mine in which I outlined that it has never been more acceptable for public companies to be unprofitable than today. But another explanation could be that investors indeed have become careless, reckless even, and many are likely experiencing some form of fear of missing out. And many are probably making investment decisions based on non-fundamental factors, such as momentum for instance. And investors are trying to justify prices with narratives and no valuation seems too excessive. The reality is probably that both explanations are true depending on which company you look at though. Chinese electric car company NIO for instance or the hydrogen fuel cell provider Black Power. They have clearly become speculative vehicles. But on the other hand, companies like Spotify, Roku or Shopify probably really have solid prospects to become the outright, outright winner in their respective field. And they will then be able to actually return cash to their shareholders at some point in the future. But quite frankly, I think these three aforementioned stocks are probably exceptions. And to me, it is quite apparent that the tech sector is clearly in bubble territory. To get back to Klarman's letter, he used, he used Tesla as an example for those st stocks that have basically turned into a speculative frenzy. And as I have outlined in my previous two Tesla videos, Elon Musk electric uh, car company has seen his, its share price skyrocket in the last year, skyrocketing or, or soaring more than 800 or 850 percent. And Mr. Klarman said that shares in the barely profitable electric car maker soared seemingly beyond all reason. And as I've pointed out in my videos, this rise of the share price has at least briefly made Elon Musk the richest, richest person in the world. And speaking of Tesla, Einhorn also commented on this particular stock in his letter that I mentioned previously. And he wrote, Tesla cars are not a fad. If they were, Tesla would sell many more than it does. The fad is owning Tesla stock. We have quipped before that twice as silly stock price is not twice as silly. It's just silly. But what about 20 times a silly price? In the 2000 internet bubble, Cisco systems peaked out at 29 times revenue, which would be a discount to where Tesla now trades. Now a point many investors in the current low interest rate environment make is that projected future cash flows are more valuable because due to the low interest rates and also because 10 year US treasury rates are only around 1%, one should use lower discount rates, a lower hurdle rate in one's valuation models. 
In many investors' framework, the discount rate is made up of the prevailing risk-free rate, which is usually the yield on US, US treasuries, plus maybe a premium to compensate for the uncertain nature of stocks. Now, the problem is that if you lower the discount rate and discount future cash flows at a lower rate, you'll end up with higher intrinsic value estimates. And depending on how low you go, much higher estimates. Let me just illustrate this with a fictional company. Based on my inputs and a discount rate of 10%, the intrinsic value estimate is $177 per share. Let's lower the discount rate to 4%. You'll already get a much higher intrinsic worth of the stock. And if you go even lower, you'll end up with a ridiculous number actually. So, depending on how low you want to go with the discount rate, you can basically justify all sorts of prices. And that's how some investors nowadays seem to justify sky-high valuations that we haven't seen in the past. And Klarman calls this approach unwise. He writes, the more distant the eventual payoff, the more the present value rises. When it comes to the value of cash flows, the vast and limitless future yet to unfold has gained considerable ground on the more firmly anchored present. The Fed's policies and programs have directly contributed to exceptionally benign market conditions where nearly everything is bid up, while downside volatility is truncated. The market's usual role in price discovery has effectively been suspended. Okay, before I move on, let me know in the comments down below which discount rates you use in your DCF models and whether you adjust the discount rate due to the current low interest rate environment. Now to get back to Klarman, the point he is making is that the future is by its definition uncertain and who knows where interest rates are going to be in 10 years. What's important to acknowledge though is that interest rates are like gravity in valuation. If interest rates are nothing, values can be almost infinite. However, if at some point interest rates go up, that will be a gravitational pull on value. And at some point interest rates will go up again. And in addition, neither perfect economic conditions nor perfect financial conditions can last forever. And, and Kleinman argues that this risk is neglected by many investors. He writes, but as with frogs and water that is slowly being heated to a boil, investors are being conditioned not to recognize the danger. And that's already it for this video. I hope you learned something. May your finances and investments prosper. Good luck. Uh -huh.